I always wanted to be Indiana Jones. Can anyone relate with me here? How about Gandalf the Wizard or Captain Nemo or an astronaut? Really, any astronaut would do. <laughs> I think we all crave adventure. We want to escape our desks, our couches, our nine to five lives. We want to do something a little bit exciting, a little bit new, maybe a little bit dangerous and certainly something fun. I think that adventure often looks like this. There are even some kind of more curated, protected versions of adventure that look like this. But I'm here to tell you today that adventure does not look like this. Now, don't get me wrong, I love movies, I love video games, these are incredible things. But until the day when they can plug into the back of my head and I can't distinguish digital content from actual reality, until that day, these things don't hold the candle to the real thing. I'm fortunate in my day job, I get to design and build adventures and exhibits for a living. We were in a client meeting recently. We were brainstorming all the new, neat ways that we could make an exhibit interactive and immersive and high-tech. You know, all those buzzwords that circulate in these meetings. After about an hour of nudging and poking this client and going over all of the options, their conclusion was the best we can do, the pinnacle of interactive entertainment in this exhibit is touchscreens. They wanted dozens of touchscreens sprinkled all around the room, each one displaying digital content in, in various attractive ways. Is this really the best that we can do? Now, again, I'm not opposed at all to digital content. I love it. I use it every day. But I think it's become the default. I want to argue today that we don't actually need these glowing rectangles to tell our stories. Once upon a time, you probably remember when education and entertainment were actually location-based, right? You had to actually physically be present to take part in these things. Now you can create content in a little room, I you like this one, and click, click, that content appears on screens all around the world, just like that. And this can be a wonderful thing. I, I think TED is really a prime example of how this can be used for good, right? Ideas worth spreading. But let me take a moment right here in this hall to show you why the screens leave something out. Let me take a moment to share a profound truth with you in a moment of blindness. This is real. You can't see. Those of you at home or you're watching this on a screen and you're wondering, what's going on? My screen went dark. You know, what am I missing? Well, here in the hall, we just had a light flash us in the face and the lights went out and now we can't see. The point is, we can do things in real time, in real space, that you can't do on a screen. We can put the lights back on. <laughs> Espionage is an hour-long walk-through adventure that my company designed and operates down in Foxborough, Mass. In one part of the adventure, your group of spies is in this set and you've got to defuse a bomb. This is a classic spy thing to do, right? Time is running out, you're racing against the clock, you realize you are not going to make it in time. And the only way to save your skin is to hustle out of that room into the adjoining blast-proof bunker, this bomb shelter that, that can save you. We've got it timed so that those blast doors are closing right as the bomb ticks down. Three, two, one, boom and you're plunged in darkness for a moment, as we just were. The emergency lights kick on after a moment, and you're in this bunker, and you realize there's electrical panels on the wall. And what we have to do is do a little puzzle. We've got to move fuses around. We have to basically restore power, get things back up and running. But that's a ruse. That's a distraction from the fact that this room in which you stand is actually built on a turntable. The, it's a spinning room and it can turn slower than the threshold of perception. So we take three and a half minutes to rotate those people 180 degrees until those blast doors, those heavy doors you walked in, well, they're facing another room. It's a duplicate of the room you were just in, except this one is destroyed. The walls are black, there's stuff falling from the ceiling, there's smoke in the air, and there's a crater in the ground where the bomb was. 
So for a moment, people believe that bomb has gone off. <laughs> Now, espionage, this was up and running long before the Boston Marathon bombing. And that real-life tragic event doesn't ha seem to have had any impact on people's perceptions of this make-believe event. What we've got really here is a classic stage illusion, right? But to people who are in the room at the time, and they're unaware of the fact that it's they who have rotated, it seems real. We have a camera on those doors. There's a security camera looking at those blast doors that I can see from my office. <laughs> and I, I love to watch it. I, lo I, I love to just see those doors slide open and try to gate. Was that two inches? or three inches that someone's jaw fell on when they see the destruction. You know, they're sold. Now, of course, they're sold because we can control every aspect of our environment with these adventures. Whether you're exploring an ancient Egyptian pharaoh's tomb, or maybe you're dodging laser beams in a spy mission making your way through, or maybe you're restoring power to the Nautilus submarine and you're, you're getting the gears running here in Nemo's ship. Whatever it is, <laughs> it's actually immersive. It's actually taking place in a 3D physical environment all around you. The company's named Five Wits not because there are five of us, as people seem to think, but because there are five senses. When you can feel, when you can taste, when you can smell the experience you're part of, in addition to seeing and hearing it, well, now it has a chance of being real, of actually being immersive to you. Nowadays, I, I think it's just about impossible to impress anybody with a glowing rectangle, right? A movie, for example, it can startle you, it can surprise you, but they really can no longer amaze us. In the developed world, we've seen it all. The special effects get better and better every year. They get more and more, what's the word we use to describe it? Realistic, right? Closer and closer to reality, it becomes more and more difficult to distinguish what am I seeing in this scene that isn't real. Let's look at another example. I love video games. Back when I was a kid, they were fairly simple. Anybody remember this? This is the old <laughs> Atari controller. We've got one joystick, we've got one button. Hours of awesomeness. <laughs> well, that progressed, right, to my favorite, the Nintendo Entertainment System. We've got a little joypad there on the left. Now we have two buttons. We have an A and a B. Four buttons. Six buttons. PlayStation controller. This is a modern... Xbox controller. I count one, two, three joystick type devices. One, two, three, four buttons from my right thumb. There's a start and a back button. There's that select. Oh, wait, there's a two buttons on top for my index fingers. There's two buttons underneath for my middle. There's a dozen buttons on this thing. Why? What is going on here? Well, we're, they're trying to give the player more and more options at once, right? The ultimate, or the current ultimate, I should say, example Microsoft Connect, right? Even more full gestural control, more options, more control. Basically, they're trying to get closer and closer to a real physical experience in real time, in real space. I'm playing a game, I've got to make a decision, I've got a choice A and B, not enough choices. I need a dozen buttons, I need to dance around the room. Well, it's still not enough. At the moment, there is no holodeck. Now, there's a lot of talks coming after me, maybe somebody's doing it, but... <laughs> At the moment, video games are constrained by the very medium that makes them widely and inexpensively distributable. But really, as much as I love them, I'm just sitting on the couch twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> We can do better than this. Do you know what the ultimate first-person experience is? It's life. It's reality. Back in the real world, as much as there's a hunger for adventure, there's a hunger for authentic convincing real experiences. And yes, it is absolutely harder to develop those real physical experiences than it is to hire a multimedia company to crank out some more content. But I think that this is relevant not just for game designers. I think this is relevant for retailers. This is relevant for educators, for trainers, for service providers. You've probably all seen this in one form or another, right? The pyramid of learning. This expresses the idea, and there's many different versions of it, that your mastery of anything useful, anything enjoyable, it progresses to the degree with which you actively participate. You retain a little of what you read and hear, more of what you see, still more of what you say, and it culminates in the ultimate, right? Physically, actually doing the real thing, and, and ultimately teaching it to others. 
my encouragement to you today is, when you have your guest physically present, they've come to you, they've come to your venue for a reason. They have a screen on their desk. They have a screen on their living room wall. They probably have a screen in their pocket. Don't settle for a glowing rectangle in your venue. Are there opportunities for real touch, for smell, maybe even for taste when you designed your buying experience, your training experience, or your service experience? We've collected a lot of data from people who've been through our immersive adventures. We're trying to figure out you know, what's working, what's not working. If I can summarize that as plainly as I can for you, there is no significant correlation between the amount of technology, the amount of money, frankly, the, the cost that goes into creating an element with people's enjoyment of that element. And that, that's surprising to me. What then do they like? What do they care about? Well, they love the spectacular. They love large-scale, all-consuming, immersive visuals, bigger, deeper than the screen. They love being the hero, especially in archetypical situations. You know, they like to dodge those laser beams and diffuse that bomb and crack that safe because that's what spies do. And they like being challenged at the right level. You remember the Othello board game slogan, a minute to learn, a lifetime to master? That sums it up perfectly. Something you can teach in a sentence or less, but which actual expertise at takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. I have one last thing I want to show you. In a room with a highly esteemed, uh, the directors from a highly esteemed educational and cultural institution lately, and the director drew this on the whiteboard, said, here's a continuum. We want our next museum exhibit to be right about here on this spectrum. Who decided, yes, you get the joke, who decided that education and entertainment were mutually exclusive? Who decided they were polar opposites? Doesn't it look more like this? It is possible to be out here. If you want to keep what you're doing fun and effective, keep it immersive, keep it real. On your next project, whatever it might be, my encouragement to you is, in whatever industry you work, don't assume digital. Don't assume a screen. If the parameters of the situation lead you to that conclusion, great. But first, really imagine, what could I actually do here physically, immersively? There's a big world outside our glowing rectangles. Thank you. <laughs>